Thank you a lot, ladies. Glad it worked out this. Uh, so I will, uh, next 30 minutes, uh, general aspects of, I am a staff scientist and a clinical project manager. Quite uh, non-specific. Um, they're young adult onset 
Young adult onset bilateral foot drop, followed by uh, progressive atrophy, uh, muscle atrophy. Uh, and only in later stages of the disease, you, you can identify that the quadrants have sparing. So as I said, these, these, these symptoms are quite nonspecific and um, uh, may be uh, mistaken for other disorders or not recognized as being DNA myopathy. Um, mostly also because many um, uh, physicians, neurologists, are unfamiliar with these disease symptoms for GNA myopathy or unfamiliar with the disease. And there is a lack of family history in patients, especially those with the non founder uh, or the non ethnic mutation. Um, muscle biopsy results. So, most patients eventually get a muscle biopsy and um, variation in muscle fiber size and the presence of, of rim vacuoles can, um, can establish a diagnosis of GNA myopathy. Uh, however, um, looking at these muscle biopsies requires expertise and familiarity with the disease, and rim vacuoles may in fact be absent in some muscle biopsies, because first the quality of the biopsy may not be good enough to, to show the, the vacuoles, or uh, the biopsy is taken in a muscle that is still quite healthy, for example, the quadriceps, where the spring vacuoles are not present. Uh, there are currently no other muscle biopsy tests available to diagnose DNA myopathy from a muscle biopsy. Uh, and there are also no other inexpensive, non-invasive diagnostic tests for DNA myopathy, like a blood test. Um, so, and then biallelic mutations in the GNA gene. Uh, this requires or DNA specific gene testing, uh, preferably done by a certified uh, laboratory, or gene testing as part of a neuromuscular gene panel. Um, so, the GNA specific testing is cost prohibitive and not readily available, although it becomes more common uh, now. It is also only ordered by neurologists when DNA myopathy is suspected. So it's not always happening for every patient with young adult onset foot drop. Uh, and not all neuromuscular gene panels include the GNA gene. So the diagnosis can be missed that way, although this is getting better too. So GNA is now included in, in, in a good amount of a neuromuscular panel. So this is a slide from about four years ago when 44 patients were enrolled in our NIH natural history study. And 35 of the patients um, um, had, <clears throat> uh, were, misdi were, uh, were misdiagnosed uh, on onset of their disease and only got the DNA myopathy uh, diagnosis on average 10 years after onset of of the disease, uh, the range of, from zero to 32 years of diagnostic delay. So here on the right, you see all the different other disorders that these patients were diagnosed with. And some patients get a diagnosis of, for example, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and they go with this a lifetime, and GNA myopathy will not be reconsidered if they, they do not you know, see the right centers or the right neurologist. So I think in the near future, this will change with, with increase of the awareness of, uh, of DNA myopathy and also with the presence of clinical trials, uh, there will be more awareness. So the diagnosis still, although it's better currently, it still needs improvement. Uh, then a little bit about the prevalence of the disease. So um, the prevalence of DNA myopathy is estimated based on, um, on mutation databases, it's at least six in a million. But let's say it's between one and six in a million uh, people. Uh, that means that uh, um, worldwide, there, there, there should be about 10,000 to 40,000 DNA myopathy cases. Uh, Currently, there are about 1,100 cases published in the literature, including the founder population. So where are the other 9,000 to 39,000 DNA myopathy cases? Um, well, I want to say about half of, half of these cases are not presenting with disease because they're under 25 years old. 
and of the other half, at least 80% may be misdiagnosed. So we really need to, to continue to do this effort to raise awareness of, of this disease, and, and I think um, the number of cases will, will increase significantly in the next few years. Um, and you can see this trend already occurring uh, due, the, due to the, the increase of awareness of the disease and due to improvement and cost reduction of genetic testing. And here I listed a few recent papers where inst instead of publishing single cases or single families, now these, these, these publications report 11 cases, 54 cases, 26 cases, 35 cases, 46 patients in, in one case report. And this is an incredible increase compared to, to just a few years ago. So this is all uh, partly uh, occurring due to the the, the international d and &E myopathy collaborations, meetings, and literature reports that, that have just the last several years uh, um, floored. Okay, then uh, I'll get into the disease mechanism and rationale for therapy. Um, d and &E myopathy is uh, caused by mutations in the g and &E gene, which occur uh, I'm not sure if you see my cursor, but it occurs in the sialic acid synthesis pathway where, where the MANEX sign is. You see DNA there. Uh, so the sialic acid synthesis pathway basically starts with glucose in the cell. It undergoes several, um, several uh, steps and can become UDP glucnet. This is converted to MANEX, to MANEX 6 phosphate, and then eventually becomes sialic acid at the bottom left in the figure. <coughs> The sialic acid goes through the nucleus to become activated, to become CMP sialic acid, which can then be used in the Golgi in the cell, in the Golgi complex, to sialylate glycoproteins, which then sit in the membrane, which you see in the upper right of the figure, uh, such as muscle protein, with the sialic acid growth sticking out at the end. And in, in an image, you see it like this, the, the, the little red, um, blocks at the ends of the proteins that are sticking through the cell membrane have the sialic acid groups. And this is, these sialic acid groups are important for signal transduction, cell-cell interaction, and are very, in muscle, very important for the contraction and the relaxation of the muscle. So if you have mutations in the GNE gene, you cannot process MANAC to MANAC 6 phosphate and you can not make enough sialic acid, not enough CMP sialic acid, and, and may not have enough sialic acid on muscle protein. So um, we, uh, we figured if we would give MANAC to, uh, to patients, or to mouse models, or to cells, uh, we could restore the defect in DNA because there is another enzyme, so-called glucnac kinase, that converts MANAC to MANAC phosphate um, to make more sialic acid in the cell, more CMP sialic acid, and to re these mus muscle membrane proteins. Uh, MANAC is a, the only neutral uh, component in this, the neutral sugars, and a very simple sugar in this pathway. Uh, it, in, it's imported into cells through a diffusion. And uh, it's historically been used by biochemists to increase sialylation in cell filters. So there are other options for therapy. So here you see the MANAC again. Another option for therapy for, for DNA myopathy would be to give patients a sialic acid, a free sialic acid. Uh, however, now sialic acid is negatively charged. It has a different mechanism to get into the cell, so it's a little bit more challenging to get it into the cell. Um, yeah. And then another option would be um, to uh, give patients sialylated glycoproteins, such as IVID or sialylactose, which have been shown to work in mice. Uh, to then in violation of glycoproteins, and another option therapy to bring in the, an, an entire new DNA gene. 
So now we get uh, to the muscle biopsy. So I, sh uh, I told you about the sialic acid groups that are sticking out at the end of the muscle, uh, the outside of the muscle membrane. There's not enough sialic acid. It may cause so-called rim vacuoles on the top right in the um, muscle biopsies of DNA myopathy patients. And if you look at these by EM, you see these aggregates in, in, in the muscle. So we developed, uh, to, to, to visualize these sialic acid groups, we developed a lectin staining method. Um, and here I'll show you uh, the, the SNA lectin that we use that binds to uh, sialic acid groups, binds to proteins on the outside of the cell. And um, they are, SNA recognizes one specific kind of sialic acid as in a very specific linkage to the, these proteins. Uh, and here you see a staining on the bottom left uh, of, of cell, muscle cell membrane stained with SNA. Uh, and, and that this can be done in both paraffin embedded or frozen sections of, of muscle biopsy. Um, so and here you see um, the staining of this SNA lectin again on the top left in a control and also of another lectin called PVA that only binds if sialic acid is absent of these proteins. So you see in a control that PVA does not really have a signal and SNA has a bright signal as expected. So in patients with DNA myopathy, the SNA signal in muscle cells is decreased and the VVA uh, signal is increased. So indicating the stylization of, of muscle protein. <laughs> so we also showed this in, a, in, in uh, the mouse model that we have at NIH, M712T, uh, for DNA myopathy. So again, SNA in a control mouse, brightly stained, VVA is absent, so fully stylated. Mutant mouse have an absent or has a greatly have greatly reduced or absent SNA signal and an increased PVA signal here in the middle panel and then in the right panel it's a it's a it's a mouse muscle after 12 weeks on on manac therapy and we add manac to the drinking water of the mice and you see that the SNA signal the dilation greatly improves and the PVA signal decreases. Um, Similar results have been shown in another mouse model with a Japanese mutation um, of uh, GNA myopathy by uh, Dr. Nishino's group, uh, where the, the mice show similar rim vacuoles in, in, in the muscle as humans and a similar aggregate on electron microscopy. Um, and compared to control mice, uh, the muscle contraction and muscle performance in mutant mice are After uh, manic therapy, both muscle contraction and motor performance increases into to the normal range, so indicating that, that manic can, can also functionally help uh, this disease, at least in mice. So based on these, these mouse results and previous uh, result, preclinical results, uh, at NIH we pursued manic as a therapy for, for g and myopathy. So a little bit about the NIH trial for DNA myopathy. So many, many people over the years have worked on this, but our basic team consists uh, of these five individuals. Uh, Dr. Nuria Carrillo, he's the principal investigator of all clinical studies. Dr. Bill Gall, he's the IND holder of MANEC for DNA myopathy and the clinical director of, uh, of our institute. Uh, uh, Ms. Kenan Bradley, she's a clinical trial coordinator working with uh, uh, Nuria Carrillo. And May Malikton and myself are uh, basic scientists working on, on patient tissues and preclinical and, and clinical outcome parameters, biochemical parameters. Um, so all studies have been, clinical studies have been performed out of uh, the NHGRI, and the NCAT Institute have helped us uh, get MANEC. Uh, approved by uh, the FDA, and currently we are partners with uh, industry, Lydia and Biosciences, and you will hear from them later on after my talk, I believe. Um, so in 2011, we started a natural history study at the NIH uh, for DNA myopathy, 
And it was started to establish clinical trial endpoints. A phase one study ran for one year um, to establish safety, tolerability, and PK in CNE myopathy patients. A phase two study uh, followed 30 months on MANAC uh, to show safety biomarkers and establish endpoints. And a multicenter pivotal trial for MANAC is, uh, is starting later this year, and you will hear about that uh, later on this morning, too. A little bit, uh, one, just one slide about each trial. A natural history study has currently 54 patients enrolled. It is a longitudinal perspective single center study. So all patients are seen in person at NIA. An initial visit followed by visits at three months, six months, 12 months, 18 and 24 months and annually thereafter. So of each patient, we have a whole battery of uh, clinical and functional tests. And the, the main reason for this natural history study was to identify clinical trial endpoints. It is very important to carefully select endpoints uh, for clinical trials uh, before you start the trial, especially for, uh, for a rare disease uh, and, and especially for a disease that is slowly progressive. So, so if, if, if you can establish efficient endpoints, you can uh, reduce the number of patients in your subsequent trials and reduce the, the time, the length of treatment in subsequent trials. Uh, in many rare diseases, there are, they have typically started without well-suited endpoints and, and have therefore failed. Um, so uh, the natural history study is also uh, trying to identify biomarkers, both for diagnostic and drug response uh, uh, purpose. Um, and for this disease, we also um, really looked at how we could approach the, the slowly progressive disease progression. So muscle strength data uh, were important for this study. And uh, we established the GNE myopathy muscle progression model. Uh, which could inform us trial design, number of patients, length of treatment, and frequency of assessment of all subsequent trials. And we also um, um, assess patient reported outcomes and um, um, determined that, that a more specific DNA myopathy, specific PRO needed to be uh, um, established, which we, uh, we have been working on. So here a little bit about the disease progression. So the early stages of the disease is on the left and the late stages on the right. So you see less and less muscle tissue, the dark tissue available, um, present. Relative quadricep sparing. Uh, at the bottom is an, an upper leg MRI where you see that the, the quadriceps on the top remain you know, there until the later stages of disease, while the hamstring gets um, um, replaced by fatty fibrous tissue. Uh, so we, uh, we recognize that the age of onset and rate of progression vary by patient. So a patient on the left may be of the same age as a patient on the right, but it's much further, but the patient on the right is much further in their disease. So we identify that as, as, um, I then, uh, following patients by chronological age may, may not be the best to uh, approach this and, and we establish the disease age for the patient, so where they are in their disease rather than what age they are. Uh, and uh, um, the disease age appears to correlate with functional tests and patient reported outcomes. Uh, one thing uh, that I want to also say, the, the, the disease progression model that we developed is based on that the, the, the muscle decline in patients is subsequential and the same muscles are, uh, are getting involved in, in the disease, are being affected uh, in, in the same uh, order in every patient. So, you start with, with lower extremity, slowly progressing to, to upper extremity. Okay, then.
then the phase one study of MANEC um, was the first in human study. Placebo controlled, double blind, single dose, 22 patients uh, were uh, divided into three cohorts, three grams, 10 grams, uh, six grams or 10 grams of single dose of MANEC. Um, uh, we established uh, a validated method for both MANEC and silic acid measurements in plasma. Uh, and the result of this phase one trial is that MANAC is safe and well tolerated, no serious adverse events after a single dose. Uh, the three and six gram doses were, were better tolerated than the 10 gram single dose. Um, MANAC PK, a pharmacokinetic, and how MANAC is processed in the blood or dose up in the blood, favors twice daily dosing. And uh, we showed that the sialic acid synthesis pathway appeared to be restored after a single dose of MANAC in that the sialic acid levels increase in blood after a single dose of MANAC shown here. Um, so after a single dose, you get three grams, six grams, or 10 grams um, in black. Um, the the MANAC peaks in blood after about two to three hours and is out of blood about 10 hours after taking a single dose. The sialic acid in blue increases slowly in blood and uh, peaks about 10 hours after taking a single dose of MANAC. And if you take a low dose, it's out of the blood in about 24 hours, but if you take six or 10 grams of MANAC, the sialic acid levels are still increased in blood 48 hours after taking a single dose of MANAC, indicating that MANAC um, uh, acts as a slow-release sialic acid. Uh, these results are uh, published in this paper, and I believe it's also in your meeting packet. Then the phase two trial, it's open label, single sensor, 12 subjects, 12 patients with DNA myopathy, um, all 12 had been in the National History Study, and we had at least three years of data on these 12 subjects already, strength data. Um, they took six grams of MANA twice daily uh, for 30 months. Eight patients completed the 30 months. Uh, <clears throat> the assessment was uh, clinical and biochemical parameters. Strength was measured by QMA, MRI, and patient-reported outcome. Plasma and intracellular markers were measured, and muscle biopsies were taken at baseline and at uh, nine, after 90 days of, of MANAC therapy. Um, the primary outcome uh, of this trial would be long, to show long-term safety, tolerability, PK, and some uh, efficacy um, outcome. The secondary uh, objectives was treatment, effect um, on clinical measures, so to, to identify a good PRO, patient reported outcome, uh, and identify clinical endpoints for subsequent trial. So safety and tolerability, um, there were no serious adverse events, although there were gastrointestinal um, uh, tolerability issues at six grams twice daily, seen in about half the subjects. So likely due to unabsorbed MANAC in the intestinal tract. Um, and patients at their 30-month visit um, took four grams three times daily, which greatly improved the tolerability and the absorption of MANAC. So in subsequent trials, um, four grams three times daily will be um, applied. A little bit about the muscle biopsies. Uh, Open biops muscle biopsies were performed at baseline and at day 90. Uh, all patients got a bi biopsy. Of this the bi conference will now be recorded. Uh, all patients got a, a biopsy uh, of the bicep uh, to have the same muscle tissue of every patient in the trial, and uh, the biceps is used. Is, is, the least affected in most patients and to get good quality uh, biopsy. And a lower extremity muscle was um, biopsied, MRI guided, uh, and we looked for actively declined, uh, an area of actively declining muscle by MRI that was easy accessible for, for biopsy. So our biopsy uh, images, you see them at the bottom, are um, 
are very nice. The, the muscle, the quality of the biopsies are nice. Um, we got 45 high quality biopsies of intact muscle tissue. Uh, of course, it will be used for a phase two trial, but there is enough tissue left to to, to share or collaborate with, with for future outcomes. Uh, if, if other markers or, or investigations need to be done on GNE myopathy muscle tissue, please contact us. There we have uh, we have available. Um, so histology staining was done, and lectin staining uh, and quantitation of the fluorescent signal was performed. EM was performed and uh, other biomarker studies are being pursued. A little bit about the muscle dilation. We, uh, we developed together with the company a new lectin staining and quantitation mod, uh, method um, using the phase 2 muscle sample. And it is, uh, this method is completely performed by blinded, blinded investigators and independent evaluators. Uh, and this met method is now also applicable for other muscle disorders uh, for, for lectin and antibody staining. Uh, the results have recently uh, be, been finalized and statistically analyzed for a final phase two report and they'll be, uh, they'll be presented for the first time at this uh, AAN meeting on Monday at uh, 4.47 by Dr. Carrillo in session S23. She will also present other phase two uh, outcomes. Um, I believe she is also planning to uh, a patient webinar over the summer to discuss the results of this phase two uh, trial with patients. Uh, and then uh, we're gearing up for a multi-center trial uh, of MANAC for GNE myopathy, uh, funded by a UO1 grant and worked with the Neuronext uh, um, network. Um, Harvard NIH collaboration and uh, the industry partner is Lydian, and you will hear more about this in, in a talk uh, later on this morning. So we had a lot of collaborators and a lot of people involved in the development of MANAC and, and to look for basic defects in DNA myopathy. Um, and uh, if you have any questions uh, about it, Clinical aspects of clinical trials, you can contact Dr. Carrillo and Dr. Bradley, of Mr. Bradley, and uh, for, for more basic research, you can contact me. So, thank you. That's I, my talk. Thank you so much for that, Nuria. Can you hear us okay? We, ha we were having a little bit of trouble at the very beginning um, hearing you, so we may ask that you do a voiceover um, if we can get a copy of your presentation. I'm not sure. But in the meanwhile, does uh, anyone have any questions for Marianne that we can ask? Gwen? <laughs> I know you were jonesing to see her. Can you make available? Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't hey, Mar hey, Marianne, this is Gwen. Um, Hi. Can, hey, can, sorry about the surgery and we're missing you here. Can you make available the slide in your presentation on the different absorption rates that you had, the curves? The diff, sorry, yeah. the The uh, graph that you had in your presentation, yeah, that one right there. Can you make that available to NDF as a clip so that we can get the information on that. So this is available, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure what is in your meeting package, but this is published paper. Ah, okay, okay. It's it, available online too, and it may be in your meeting package today. Is it, is it from the Molecular Genetics and Metabolism uh, yes. article? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that. Actually, we did. you did send us three documents that, in the interest of uh, environmental protection, we emailed to you with a link. We'll do that again for those of you who can read it online, and we'll make it available on our website. Are there any other questions? There's a question over here for you, Marianne. Just hold on, and then we do have to make up some time. So one sec. Um, thanks, Doctor. It was um, a really informative uh, presentation. Um, in the presentation, you mentioned something about um, endpoints for cl clinical trials and how, you know, identifying those 
ahead of time helps with, uh, you know, when the trial is conducted. Can you talk a little more about that? Like, what are endpoints? Uh, so endpoints are, um, are clinically um, relevant parameters. Uh, so the FDA um, is asking for, for therapies that are meaningful for patients. Patients can can do better. Have the patient reported outcomes so that patients feel better, do better, function better. So endpoint as uh, increasing sialic acid in muscle is not an endpoint to uh, approve a therapy on. So the clinically meaningful endpoint is that you can now comb your hair or that you can now tie your shoelaces. So we have that that is a patient reported outcome. Uh, also, proving statistically significant increase in strength of certain muscle groups would be a, um, a clinically meaningful outcome. So, so rather than uh, a scientific outcome showing increase in muscle sialation, that helps, but it's not um, an outcome that can does that make what, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. We have one final question, and then we're going to go over to Lydian. Um, hold on one moment, please. Hey, Marianne, it's Gwen again. Um, on your muscle measurement outcomes, will we be able to see that information, or is it available? Yeah, so we, have, we have published a method in the muscle and nerve. Uh, I don't know if you see my screen. Um, a muscle and nerve publication that came out last year, and uh, we are publishing the, the final uh, violation results together with all phase, uh, re statistically analyzed results um, very soon. And Dr. Carrillo is presenting all of this uh, in, in this AAN meeting. Okay, but in terms of publication, so we can access that when? Yes. So the, the method is already published in muscle and nerve, and the results of the phase one trial using this method will be uh, submitted for publication this year. What about phase two? Yes, that, that, that will be submitted. And Dr. Carrillo is presenting the results in two days. So after that, we OK, thank you. So I assume that means that after in two days we can have access to it and share that with our patient population? Um, that I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll follow up with you. Um, uh, Marianne, I just really wanted to thank you for waking up really early on the West Coast to do this for us. I'm sorry about your surgery. We're glad to have you back. Um, and next time we hope to see you in person. Thank you so much. If we have any other follow-up questions, we'll email them to you. But thanks again for participating in our event. A round of applause Bye. for Marianne. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.